Tonight, a small victory for the province in its battle against the federal carbon tax. It's all about perspective, right? You can enjoy it and have a good time. Summer is here and we check in to see how people will beat the heat. A story that needs to be told, I mean, we'll take a two-page spread to tell it or we'll take three pages to tell, we'll take whatever it takes. And against all odds, some small town newspapers in Saskatchewan are finding ways to thrive. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It's Monday, July 8th, and welcome to the CBC Saskatchewan News. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dan Plaster. Now, many have been asking for it, and summer has finally arrived, and with a vengeance as it was a hot and smoky day for most of the province. A low pressure system is bringing some extreme heat and it's likely to stay a while. Pratush Tael has more on how people are coping. And they could get ice cream. Lime and vanilla ice cream. What better way to beat the heat than some good old ice cream? On hot days I like going in the water to cool down. Or a picnic in the shade. I'm running in the spray park, enjoying the coolness of the water and enjoying some fruits. It's awesome. We were like having water and like you can do it around it, like shoots water and we were spraying water at each other. I love the heat. The hotter the better. I'm all for the heat. Our winters are so long here in Saskatchewan that I embrace the summer, what little of it we have. Well, I mean, I love going to like the beach and it's just like really fun. But it's about to get hotter as Western Canada's first heat wave of the year soars through Saskatchewan. Environment and Climate Change Canada says daytime highs are forecasted to be about 30 to 35 degrees, meaning much of the province will be under heat warnings. Wednesday is probably going to be the hottest day in the far north uh, of Saskatchewan. Um, to get a sense of whether records will be broken, yeah, there's potential for some to be broken, uh, especially right uh, farther south, right along the uh, the Canada-U.S. border. Uh, in particular, there are some, some possibilities of records being broken. The agency says vulnerable people should try to stay indoors or limit time outdoors if possible especially given the air quality index. Extreme heat can affect anyone. However, Indigenous peoples, older adults, infants and young children, and people with chronic illnesses are at greater risk. This can include people with diabetes, those experiencing mental illness, or those with cardiovascular or lung disease. The Saskatoon Community Clinic is getting ready to help anyone who needs it, offering drinking water, a place to cool down inside, and an outdoor misting tent. We need to be thinking about vulnerable populations that might not have similar access to some of the some of the things that can help us cool down. We handed out about 25, 30,000 water bottles last year from the clinic. We're continuing that this year, so uh, folks can come to our door for water for free. High temperatures are expected from Tuesday to Thursday, but you can expect some relief when things cool down over the weekend. British Real, CBC News, Saskatoon. The city of Saskatoon has implemented its extreme heat emergency plan. It will be setting up other cooling station locations, giving out water and doing wellness checks. City buses are also available for people needing shelter or emergency help. Now it's also reminding people that cooling off in the river is not advised because swimming is prohibited and the current is unpredictable. Also, don't forget your pets. Make sure they have enough water and consider getting a wading pool or some damp towels to cool them off. The Saskatchewan government has been granted an interim injunction against the Canada Revenue Agency. The lawsuit was filed by the provincial government last week. The lawsuit claims the CRA is unconstitutionally attempting to seize $28 million from the Saskatchewan government. Ottawa says that's the money it's owed from the province for refusing to collect or remit the federal carbon tax on natural gas since January. Court documents show the actual outstanding debt is closer to $50 million. The minister responsible for Sask Energy says he's pleased with the court decision. We're optimistic um, and confident in our case uh, and in the, the legal arguments behind the case that we will put forward. Um, but, you know, certainly pleased that the court saw fit to uh, uh, agree with the injunction and to stop the federal government from garnishing the province's bank accounts. The province says Ottawa's decision to exempt home heating oil from the carbon levy was unfair to Saskatchewan, which uses natural gas. The injunction, a preliminary step until a hearing can be held on the lawsuit's merits. 
Two of the province's Crown Corporations have filed their annual reports. SaskTel says it did make a profit, but it was down by $8 million compared to last year. For SGI, its net income has doubled. However, even with the income spike, SGI says it doesn't have enough money to make dividend payments to the province. This is the second year in a row the organization hasn't paid that money. SGI says that's because it had to spend $230 million on computer system and software upgrades. We wouldn't be able to compete uh, SGI Canada with other insurers. Uh, uh, the systems that um, uh, we have just implemented, the new systems, will allow us to be much more flexible in terms of introducing new products and being able to respond to changes in the marketplace. SaskTel has declared dividends, but those dividends are down from 90% to 40%. SaskTel says the decrease is because of its infrastructure investments into boosting internet services in rural areas. The drug crisis continues in Saskatchewan, and it's leaving many children without their parents. So it's often the grandparents who are being called upon to raise them. We meet a Kokum who is doing so in a big way, even as she deals with her own trauma. Jenny Whitfield has more. It's a pretty typical night in Faye Robinson's home. Natalie, Nira, this is for you. The 50-year-old grandmother serves up dinner like an army cook. <laughs> She's helping to raise 14 grandchildren. I started out with these three and this one. And then one granddaughter at five. Next thing you know, bang, ended up getting three more. Well, actually four more. Then they turn of age, the older ones. I ended up getting three more. And then bang another four more. We have lots of grandchildren, I tell you. <laughs> Robinson has stepped up to care for her grandchildren. Is Michaela going to eat my girl? Because her five adult children have all struggled with drug addiction. Last year, two of her sons died. One from heart complications brought on by drug abuse. The other was shot and killed. Two of Robinson's adult daughters have moved home with their children. Oh, the love is different. Totally different from when you're raising your own kids. <laughs> to a grandchild, it, the love is deeper. Deeper love, different kind of love, totally different. And you really appreciate them more, eh? <laughs> hey! 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 It's a long-standing tradition in Indigenous culture for grandparents to adopt or care for grandchildren. But... The stress is, it's not the same situation as it was 25 years ago. This First Nations social worker says, crystal meth and fentanyl are consuming a generation of parents and putting this older generation under considerable strain. It's much harder for those grandparents to be taking care of their grandchildren and also have to then be there to support a child who is addicted to crystal meth or fentanyl or whatever drugs. Happy birthday to you. Robinson is dealing with her own childhood trauma and now the grief from losing two sons. She says many grandparents struggle to care for their grandchildren in the midst of so much pain. But they do the best they can. And that's the same thing with, with us. We do the same thing, but try to do the best we can to move on with our lives and we know that they need us, the children, the grandchildren need us. All right, here. And she hopes her love keeps those grandkids safe and gives them hope for a better future. You're not getting another cake, no. Jenny Whitfield, CBC News, Saskatoon. Thanks, Jenny. After more than a century of entertaining Canadians, the RCMP's iconic musical ride is in trouble. An internal audit shows it's struggling with staffing problems and low morale. As Catherine Tunney explains, this could threaten the program's future. It's one of the RCMP's, and arguably one of Canada's, most recognizable symbols. The musical ride. Mounties in their red uniforms, on horseback, performing for crowds. But behind the pageantry, we now know the mood has been more downtrodden. According to an internal RCMP audit, the musical ride doesn't have enough riders and faces a significant threat to its sustainability. Riders are now forced to serve longer than they want and morale is low. To know while my replacements are coming, it's very unsettling. And it could be, uh, you know, a major cause of stress and uh, 
and uh, a lot of uh, hardship on families as well. The problems flagged in the audit aren't unique to the musical ride. They point to a deeper staffing problem plaguing the RCMP. The force in some cases is broken when its own when its own members aren't prepared to join one of the most iconic symbols of the force. Well, then how why should we support it? Across Canada, RCMP detachments are grappling with shortages. Vacancy rates are as high as 20% in some parts of the country, and recruitment numbers have dwindled in recent years. In a rural province like New Brunswick, where the RCMP does the majority of the policing, it makes it very difficult. According to the audit, RCMP brass say they want to keep the ride as long as possible, in part because it remains their largest public relations vehicle at a time when the Mounties face increasing challenges and criticism. The Canadian public's support of the RCMP is crucial. Fahi says the RCMP is working on plans to fill these saddles with members next season. Filling the overall staffing gaps? That could take years. Catherine Tunney, CBC News, Ottawa. Country Thunder Music Festival in Craven kicks off this week, and as fans get ready for four days of music and fun, organizers say the site is ready to welcome the hordes of people, as well as the expected heat wave. Troy Volhofer is the president of Country Thunder, and he says they have four water trucks and plenty of cool resting spots ready for the festival. And they'll also be adding 48 RCMP members in the vicinity to ensure safety. Mayor Sandra Masters, she'll be heading to Country Thunder, and she says the event is a big economic driver for Regina and brings in an extra $3 million in spending every year. I'm also pleased to announce that the city of Regina has officially proclaimed July 10th to 16th as Country Thunder Saskatchewan Week. This proclamation celebrates the significant impact that this festival has on our community. Treat each other kindly, dance, like no one is watching and sing along to the unbelievable artists that Country Thunder has lined up for us this year. Country Thunder runs Thursday to Sunday in Craven and features Luke Combs, Nickelback, Dallas Smith and Gary Allen. The festival is also expecting its one millionth guest this year. That person will be showered with perks when they come through the gates. A hazy river view in Saskatoon greeted people on their lunch breaks this afternoon. It was much of the same in Regina as people enjoyed a bit of time on the lake. Now the whole province will creep into a heat wave this week and also try to fight through the smoky conditions. Tariq Reed will be back after the break to give us a complete rundown. The weather update is brought to you by Capital Ford Lincoln, proud partner of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. A lot of people have asked for it. I don't know if I really did, not to this extent, but uh, Tyreek Reed is in now with the weather and uh, just how hot and gross is it gonna be? Yeah, Dan, you know, I don't think I asked for it either because it was looking pretty gross out today throughout much of Saskatchewan. We had heat warnings, air quality advisory statements, and air quality statements as well from Environment Canada. Throughout much of the province, we saw those air quality statements in southern Saskatchewan. Those have since ended. Now we're just looking at these watches and warnings in central parts of the province all the way up into the north. A lot of this is for the heat. We're seeing that heat wave move through the province. Many of these areas saw daytime highs between 30 and 35 degrees today so it was definitely a hot one and of course we're still seeing air quality advisories for our friends to the northwest and the moral of the story here is to just stay inside escape that heat be in cooler um it places indoors if you can and of course you want to keep those windows closed as much as possible if you are underneath those air quality statements and advisories now let's take a look at our current temperatures board we're still seeing temperatures in the upper 20s for our friends in the north and in central saskatchewan where we are still seeing those heat warnings issued down in southern saskatchewan we weren't seeing any heat warnings today for our friends here but we're still seeing temperatures in the mid and upper 20s even in the 30s for our friends over in Maple Creek to the west. And you know, we're still gonna be feeling this heat as we move further 
into the week. If we take a look at our jet stream here, seeing those orange and yellow colors as we head into Thursday, which is going to be one of our hottest days for a lot of areas in the province. And let's take a look at our smoke map here. We're still going to be seeing that smoke travel throughout the north tomorrow. And as we head further down into south and central Saskatchewan, we're still going to be seeing a lot of that haze as well. So a lot of this messy weather that we're seeing today, we're not going to be done with just yet. It's going to be sticking around with us as we head further into the week. A lot of clearing though today and for tomorrow as well. We could see some pop-up showers tomorrow, but nothing severe. And as we head into Wednesday, a lot of dry weather. But then Wednesday night, we're going to be seeing those showers move in with the potential to bring some thunderstorms as well. The wind not providing much relief either. We, they, we are seeing some pretty slow wind speeds, but on Wednesday, that's when it'll start to pick back up. Now let's take a look at our seven-day forecast. Very, very hot weather here in Regina. Feeling almost like 40 on Thursday. For our friends in Saskatoon as well, same story for our friends there. You know, the Humid X feeling more like 40 on Thursday as well. Thursday is definitely going to be one of our hottest days for us here in South and Central Saskatchewan. Also in Saskatoon, we are going to be expecting some showers as we head further into the week and into the weekend ahead. But for now, we really want to pay attention to that heat, Dan, and we're going to want to keep those water bottles close to our side. All right. Thanks, Tariq, and we'll talk to you later. No problem. There's a lot of pressure playing at home, uh, having the, you know being the four-time defending champion right now. Um, you know they they are prepared and getting themselves ready, and I think they would like to aspire for that. Uh, however, they are trying to make sure that they stay grounded and focused and paying attention to just the what's in front of them right now. Some of the top football players across Canada are gathered in Regina for the U18 Football Canada Cup. Saskatchewan started off their pursuit of five straight national championships with a dominating 36-7 victory over Manitoba. Games continue on Wednesday as they try to beat the Heat, with the championships going this Saturday. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back. Now there's no question the media industry in this country is facing challenges, from cuts and closures to news blackouts on social media. But there's a unique challenge for small local newspapers. The communities they serve are shrinking, making it harder and harder to stay alive. Still, as Ethan Williams tells us, some of these papers are turning a page. And they're not just surviving, they're thriving. These are just some of the weekly newspaper publications you can find in Saskatchewan. Papers from Fort Capel, Rosetown, Maple Creek, Whitewood, some over a century old, record keepers of entire communities. But their numbers are dwindling. Right now, 57 are represented by the province's weekly newspaper association, but at one time, nearly 160 were. Many have closed, others have merged, and those that remain are faced with a bumpy media landscape. And yet, there are some making the best of a challenging situation. So the World Spectator weekly newspaper in Mooseman is entering its 140th year of publication. And it serves Mooseman and a whole bunch of surrounding communities here in southeastern Saskatchewan. And the publisher of this paper says business here has never been better. This is the printing plate from the very first issue. The World Spectator is the province's oldest surviving weekly newspaper. Publisher Kevin Weedmark took it over in 2002. It had a circulation of around 1,700 then. Now it's over 5,000. That's not including two additional regional papers the World Spectator publishes. Part of the secret to its longevity and profitability, Weedmark says, is that it's an independently owned publication. We are not focused on the bottom line. And if, if uh, um, we have a story that needs to be told, I mean, we'll take a two-page spread to tell it, or we'll take three pages to tell it, we'll take whatever it takes to get that story out there, because that's the important thing, and that's what people are looking for. Even if it means making space for ads from 140 businesses to create a special shop local section of a recent edition of the paper. And we add that all up and, and publish the section, you know, and, and let people know, you know, all these businesses together, you know, employ 3,000 or so of your friends and neighbours. They contribute 1.5 million in donations to local community projects. 
we don't tell people this is why you should shop local, we, we show them. We show them um, exactly what impact that makes. But the head of Saskatchewan's Weekly Newspapers Association says the health of his industry is mixed. While the World Spectator is clearly thriving, others are struggling. We've got a lot of newspapers that uh, have a lot of interest and a lot of readers in their communities. Uh, their problem is primarily a revenue um, problem. We've had uh, uh, communities that have lost their own business bases and these traditionally used to be big supporters of the, of the newspapers. And that's not just a Saskatchewan issue. Data from the Local News Research Project out of Toronto Metropolitan University shows more than 500 local news operations closed across the country between 2008 and June 1st of this year. More than three quarters of those were community newspapers that publish fewer than five times a week. The head of the Local News Research Project says community newspapers are vital to democracy covering important council meetings, clearing up rumor and misinformation, and building community. But we know that journalism um, uh, provides uh, people with a sense of what their community is and who lives in it and how it functions. You're going to meet people and learn about them and learn about their challenges that they face or their successes, even though you don't meet them face to face. Perfect. Ashley Bocek knows many of the faces in Mooseman. She grew up here. Now she's a part-time reporter for the World Spectator, proving there's new blood in an old industry. I find I learn way more by interviewing people and hearing their stories than I would in reading a textbook about something. No one really my age reads the paper anymore or doesn't really care to read the paper. And I think for me working here and our business, I think it's important to show that um, newspapers are still here and that this news in our local community is important and that your story is important. I went over them again just to make sure I'm getting There's everything. Some. And Casey's around? Yeah, she said she's available. So. Kevin Weedmark is still trying to convince Bocek to go to journalism school, but for now, she's sticking to a degree in education. Weedmark says the future of his industry might look bleak. Despite that, he sees opportunities. There's nothing magical about what we do here. If we can make a success of this business in Moosom and Saskatchewan, there's no reason the same couldn't be true across the country. And I see probably just all that needs to change is just an, an attitude that this is a this is a, a service, a public service, first and foremost, a community service. And he says he and his team will be there to cover it. Ethan Williams, CBC News, Mooseman. Tariq is back for one more look at the weather. Just how hot is this week going to look? Yeah, Dan, so you know, tonight is looking pretty warm here in Regina with lows at around 17 degrees. That's above seasonal for overnight lows for this time of the year. Heading into tomorrow morning, we're still going to be feeling a lot of that warmth, and we could be waking up to that haze, much like we did today heading into the afternoon. Those smoky and hazy conditions will be sticking around with us, and we'll be seeing daytime highs closer to 30 in the upper 20s for us here in Regina. Over in Saskatoon, for our friends there who are underneath this heat warning right now, very hot conditions tonight as well, seeing lows at around 19 degrees. Heading into tomorrow morning, still feeling that warmth, and heading into tomorrow afternoon, daytime highs will be closer to 30. Dan? Uh, it's going to be good, so you stay cool. You too. All right. <laughs> and that's all we have for you tonight. And uh, if you missed a little bit of it, uh, check us out on our YouTube channel. And, uh, of course, we'll be back tomorrow at 6 with myself and Tariq. Everybody, have a great night.